Hi guys, welcome to Little Wicket Railway. I'm Rob and in this video we're building baseboards. Specifically the baseboards for my storage area that's going to go down here in this corner. This is the first video documenting the build of the new layout and if you want to see the design of that layout then I'll put a link to that video up here. It's taken me a while to get going because I wanted to plan as much as I could before I started but at some point you've just got to get building and obviously the place to start is baseboards. Let me remind you that the purpose of this channel was to share what I learned along the way. I'm not an expert and as you'll see I'm also no carpenter but I'll show you what I did for Little Wicket. You might get some ideas or pick up some tips. Either way, hopefully it'll be relatively entertaining and you can enjoy the build with me. How to build a good baseboard is one of those topics in this hobby that can really divide opinion. And I suspect there'll be some people watching this video shaking their heads thinking, oof, I wouldn't have done it that way. There are various options for the design, the materials and the construction. The method you use will depend on your layout requirements and I don't think there's a single right way of doing things. There's obviously good practice and there are definitely things you shouldn't do. If you've got some tips on building baseboards then please share them in the comments below and if you'd like to see more videos on the build then please subscribe to the channel. Before I show you what I did to build this, let's have a quick chat about design options and materials. You need to design your baseboards with your specific layout requirements in mind. Does it need to be lightweight and mobile to go to exhibitions, fold away under a bed or fit through a loft hatch? Or is it going to be fixed to a wall and never move like mine is? Let's split the baseboard design into two areas, the framework that provides the structure and then the area for the track that's on top which is supported by the framework. For the framework I considered two different options. One was a box frame which is just like it sounds, you basically make a four sided box and you'll have some supports going across inside to provide extra strength. The other was an L girder design and this is where you make a couple of L shaped girders and then you can place supports above them and across them. Both designs have advantages and disadvantages. L girders are very strong meaning you can have quite long spans and they're also very versatile because you can place your cross supports anywhere on them. So you can provide support exactly where you need it and you can make them as wide or as narrow as you like which is great if you're planning a curved edge to your baseboard. The disadvantage of L girders is they take up quite a lot of vertical space because you've got the height of the girder plus the height of the cross supports on top of them. Whereas the box design is great if you plan on having a large flat area with the same width all along because you can build your frame, drop a board on top and it will be supported all the way round. It also doesn't take up as much vertical space because you've only got the height of the frame plus the board on top. I'll be using both designs on the layout but for the storage yard vertical space is a consideration and it's a large flat rectangular area so I opted for a box frame. Now we need to consider the second part, how to support the track. Generally there are two options here. Open frame where we leave the frame open and just have the track supported where you need it. This works particularly well if you have track on different levels or closed frame where we cover the entire frame in some material and this works well if you've got a lot of track or scenery on the same level. Because my storage area is going to be totally flat with lots of track on the same level I chose to completely cover it with a board. Now let's talk materials. There are a few factors that will impact on your choice of materials. The two biggest are likely to be the environment and the budget. With the environment, will it have to deal with temperature changes and moisture such as a garden shed or will it be somewhere that the temperature is always the same and it's pretty dry? And with the budget, plain square edge timber already cut to size might be easier to work with but it's likely to be expensive. Whereas salvaged or recycled wood, whilst maybe not perfect, could be a lot cheaper or even free. It'd take ages to run through all the possible materials available for building baseboards but here are some commonly used options. Each has pros and cons. Some are more expensive, others don't handle moisture well, some come in limited sizes and thicknesses, some might not be easy to find in your local DIY shop. 
there isn't one size fits all and you need to do your homework. There's plenty of information out there on websites and forums and there are even books dedicated to the subject. Whatever you choose, there are a few key things that are going to be important for almost every baseboard. One, is it strong and stable enough to hold whatever you plan to put on it? You don't want it wobbling around or collapsing mid-running session. Two, will it change shape, warp or sag over time, which might ruin your track work? And three, is it level and will it stay level because even the slightest unplanned gradient can cause problems? As I said, I'm no baseboard expert, in fact my previous attempts at baseboards were pretty terrible. And I'm no carpenter, but I don't think you have to be. Just do your research and take your time. So let me tell you a bit about this baseboard and then I'll show you how I built it. This is going to be the lower level storage area and it's going to be attached to these two walls and it's going to be about this high. It's held up on trestles at the moment. It's 16 foot long, so it continues down off camera in that direction. It's about 65 centimeters wide for the length of it, apart from this bit, which needs to be wider to accommodate a return loop. And it's actually three baseboards connected together and they're going to be held together by bolts. You might just be able to see one there. There are two reasons I've broken this into three different boards. First, as a single board, it would just be far too heavy to move. And secondly, if we ever decide to move house, it would be good to be able to break it down into manageable chunks that can be packaged up and moved separately. As I've already explained, I've gone for a closed box frame design because vertical height is important to me. With an L girder, it would be significantly deeper. And I don't need it to be super strong because the majority of the weight can be held by the wall. And it's closed because this is all going to be covered with track at the same level. So it makes sense just to put one solid flat top on it. I used plywood for everything here. And plywood is a pretty standard material for making baseboards. It's just thin layers of wood glued together to make up a single sheet. And it comes in a variety of qualities and thicknesses. This is the standard stuff you get from a DIY shop. It's described as class two uh, exterior hardwood, which means it's suitable for humid areas or exposed to occasional wetting. For the frame, I've used 18 millimeter plywood and I cut this into strips from an eight x four sheet. And I'll show you how I did that in a second. Each sheet was around 40 pounds and it's worth asking the suppliers if they'll cut the wood to size for you. Nowhere around here does that. So I had to use my circular saw, which was terrifying. 18 mil is pretty thick and if this was going to be a mobile layout I'd probably go for something slightly thinner but because this is permanent 18 mil is fine. Then for the top I've used a sheet of 9 mm plywood again cut from an 8x4 sheet which cost 30 pounds. You might be able to get away with thinner if you supported it correctly but again it's not going to be moved around 9 mil will be just fine and it won't sag. I know some people like to use large sheets of insulating foam as a top for their frames. Something I've never done, it, it saves weight, but I'm gonna stick with ply. Right, so let's go back in time and I'll show you how I put this all together. To slice up the 18 mm plywood sheets, I used my circular saw and I was worried this might cause the wood to splinter as the blade passed through it. To reduce the chance of this happening, I bought a really fine tooth blade and set the depth to only slightly deeper than the wood. This means that when the teeth come through the wood, they're pushing in the direction of the cut rather than downwards, which might cause the bottom layers to detach. Using this setup, I got really smooth, clean cuts. I'll leave an affiliate link to the blade in the description below. Right, so I think we're about ready to start cutting. I've changed the blade in the circular saw, I've set the depth, I have measured the line I want to cut and I've also measured the line and secured a fence in place, I think it's called a fence, I don't know, um, for me to move the saw along. Got my goggles on, got my ear defenders and let's give this a go and see how it turns out. I don't really like using the circular saw, it ranks up there as one of the more terrifying power tools I own but I didn't have any issues with it throughout the build. If you keep a secure grip on it, then it's absolutely fine. It didn't kick at all. Goggles are essential though, ear defenders are recommended, and as you'll see, the saw created way more sawdust than I was expecting. 
If the weather allows, then I'd recommend doing this outside. I had to vacuum and dust down everything in the area after this, but fortunately all my models were stored away in boxes. Using a long straight piece of material as a fence or guide, secured in place with clamps or small screws, is also a good idea, so I was on the right lines there, but you'll need to make sure whatever you're using is perfectly straight and doesn't bend. And I'll let past Rob explain what happened. Okay, so a few lessons learnt there. The plastic bridge bends in the middle, so I don't think this is gonna be particularly straight. Maybe another screw needed there. I also think I need to be wearing a mask because the sawdust is getting to me. Right, slight change of plan. I've discovered the tool that goes on the circular saw, so I'm gonna give that a go and see how it turns out rather than using the wonky fence. I don't know why I didn't consider using the guide that came with the saw in the first place. I think I just thought that because the guide wasn't very long, it might not be very accurate, but as you'll see, it was fine. The ideal tool for this job would be a table saw, but I don't have the budget or the space for one of those, and I wouldn't be able to move the boards around on my own. If you do plan on working inside, then whatever tool you use, it's worth paying a bit more for one that has a vacuum attachment. Sadly, my saw doesn't, so I added another layer of dust to everything in the area. A lot easier, a lot quicker to just use the guide that comes with the tool. However, Make sure you use it on a straight edge first of all, because if you've already cut a slightly wonky edge, it's going to follow the slightly wonky edge. Lessons learned on this one, I still think it's going to be perfectly usable, but for when we come to do the next set of baseboards, then we'll definitely want to be using a straighter edge with that tool. So, uh, I've mic'd up properly, so the sound quality might have changed. Although this squatting is killing me, I'm going to kneel down. I've decided that I'm going to cut those two bits again because the staging is so important and I want it to be perfect. I'm going to still use the um, guide that comes with the saw because I thought that worked pretty well. It's just it followed the contours from my not so good cut first time around. So I've spun the board around behind me so that I've now got a perfect flat edge to follow. So we're going to do it again. I've got plenty of wood. This is a learning experience. Let's give it another go. I think we can say that that is significantly better. A lot straighter. I'm fairly happy with that. We'll do another one of those. Right, again, that felt like a better cut apart from when I got the plug caught on the edge of the board. This is a method that we can keep using. So far, it's going all right, I think. So with the two long sides of the box frame cut, it was time to cut the cross supports. Again, I started by slicing some 10 centimeter strips from the larger board. Once I got into the swing of things, this didn't take very long at all. Looking a sausage surprise in Oxford, I bet he is. That's enough wood cut for the cross section bit bracing so now I am going to get the chop saw out and cut that into 16 and a half centimeter length and I should get four out of each bit that I've cut. The key thing with this step is to get your measurements right and remember to take into account the width of the saw blade which can actually be quite thick on these. If you stack the wood to be cut then it saves time and they should come out at the same length. Fortunately this is one tool that does have a vacuum attachment so it didn't make much mess. You might be able to see on the video that the slice strips are already slightly warped so they can be a little bit difficult to line up. Next time I do this I'll clamp the ends together to make sure everything stays aligned. And you don't need a powered saw to do this, an ordinary hand saw will do the job, it'll just take a bit longer. Right, we've got some cross members, some supports to go between the two long bits so um, let's drop those in and see whether they fit. But before putting these in place, I needed to drill some holes in them for the wiring. For this, I used a pillar drill with a 30 mm drill bit. I decided to put a hole every 10 cm, so in these that meant five holes. To avoid splitting the wood, I drilled halfway from one side and then flipped it over to complete the hole from the other side. This technique was borrowed from Peter from Superior Model Railroads, who runs a YouTube channel with some great information and advice, and I'll drop a link to his channel in the description. 
You could get away with fewer holes and using a handheld power drill, but seeing as I'll be drilling hundreds of holes, I decided to invest in a pillar drill and vice, which once set up is a far quicker way of doing things. Even with these tools, it's still pretty time consuming. And as with the circular saw, it also creates a lot of mess. Popping the little round discs out of the holes is very satisfying though. It was time to begin putting the first board together and I started with one of the end pieces. I used a 90 degree clamp to hold the two bits of wood in place and the important thing was that they were clamped at the same height so that the board on top would lay flat. I then marked where I wanted the two screws to go by finding the centre line of the cross support and measuring 3cm from the top and 3cm from the bottom. The screws I used were self-tapping and self-countersinking, but I was concerned that they might split the wood, so I decided to drill 3mm pilot holes and then use a countersink bit to ensure a flat finish. I then applied some Evo stick wood glue to the joint before putting the two screws in. After doing the first few screws I realised quite quickly that it was far easier to apply the glue before clamping and drilling the pilot holes. The screws I used were 4x50mm and they're the type of screws you'd use on decking boards to ensure they pull the two parts together firmly. Any excess glue that was squeezed out was then just wiped away, but it dries clear anyway. Before I could put any other supports in, I needed to check that they weren't going to interfere with any of the point motors or other electronics. So I printed off a track plan and marked the position of the point motors and the frog juicers. I then arranged the supports at 49cm centres, unless they needed to be moved slightly to avoid the point motors or the electronics. Once in position, it was back to clamping, drilling pilot holes, countersinking, gluing and screwing. This took quite a bit of time and both my drill and camera batteries died. Start of a new day, drill's fully charged, camera's fully charged and we're going to get this baseboard finished. Once you get into a routine it comes together quite quickly but it's still a fair amount of work. I stupidly did everything on the floor, it would have been far more comfortable to do this on a workbench if you had one available. Once the first frame was finished it was time to do it all again for the second frame. When both frames were complete it was back to the circular saw to cut two tops for them from the 9mm plywood. These were secured to the frame using more wood glue and then held in place using some slightly shorter screws, again with pre-drilled 3mm pilot holes and countersinks. I found that kneeling on the board as I made my way along helped to hold the board in place and allow the glue to bond. It's now that you can correct any slight warping in the frame by making sure it lines up perfectly with the edge of the board before screwing. I use three screws for each cross support, one at either side and one in the middle. I then made the smaller frame for the return loop. I clamped this in place next to the larger frame and drilled holes for the wiring between the two boards. I also drilled four 8mm holes which will take the M8 coach bolts which connect the frames together. I was really impressed with the coach bolts, they've got this square neck on them that's designed to stop them from turning once inserted. But I was thinking, how am I going to make a square opening for it? I'm literally trying to squeeze a square peg into a round hole. But once you start tightening the nut, the square part just sinks easily into the wood and they feel really secure. I used four bolts to hold the smaller return loop frame to the larger frame, which felt about right. Once the frames were connected, I laid out the track plan and traced around it to mark where I needed to cut for the baseboard top. This time I used the jigsaw to cut the curved edges required from the 9mm ply. That was then secured in place using more glue and screws. So there we go, three closed box frame plywood baseboards. And I'm not going to attach these to the wall just yet because I want to be able to lift them up to a comfortable height and take them away 
to work on whilst I install all the point work and the electronics. One other thing I need to do before I can start laying track work on here is to cover the boards with this five millimeter Arbiton um, underlay, which will absorb sound. And credit to this idea goes to Charlie from Chadwick Model Railway for suggesting it. Um, they're large sheets of polystyrene and I'm just gonna secure them to the board using PVA. If we talk about cost, including the wood, the screws, the glue, and the five mil underlay, we've got around 40 square feet or 3.7 square meters of baseboard for around 100 pounds, which I don't think is too bad. Obviously, I've used quite a few power tools in this video, and if you don't already have them, that's gonna substantially increase the cost, but you probably don't need all of them. As a minimum, I think a power drill is pretty essential, and you can do most of the cutting with a jigsaw. Also, some clamps are pretty useful. As I said, I'm no woodworking expert, and I'll be honest, that took me quite a long time to do. But I was working alone, and if, unlike me, you have a friend willing to help, then it would be a lot quicker. Another option is to buy your baseboards pre-made. And I watched Richard from New Junction's recent baseboard video with envy as everything was unloaded from the van, set up in what looked like a few hours maybe, and they even had time for a coffee and chat. Right, I've still got a few more baseboards to make for this lower level, and then I can start on the helix and the upper levels. If you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like and subscribe to the channel. I would really appreciate it. If you would like to support the channel and the build, then I've also got YouTube memberships and a Patreon account. And this gets you a monthly members update, early access to videos and some other perks. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching and I will hopefully see you again soon.